Take it away. We're going live. Good morning from Manila. Good rainy morning. We are on the fourth day of our summit, the USAP summit, and we shall begin our day with paper presentations from the winners of the Don Isabella de los Reyes Award. To introduce our speaker, we have architect Hildebrand de los Reyes de Meterio, who finished his studies at the University of Santo Tomas. He is the owner of Butterboy Croissant, and he received his basic culinary training in the southern regions of Italy. He specialized in French pastries under the renowned American chef Peter Yuen. He belongs to the Chinese branch of Don Isabella Reyes' big family. And so we shall roll the VPR. Hi, I am Hildebrand de los Reyes de Materio, and I am an architect and a food entrepreneur. I am a direct descendant of Don Isabella de los Reyes through his Chinese wife, Maria Lim de los Reyes, and through their son, Uso de los Reyes. Don Isabella insisted that his Chinese-blooded children carry beautiful Filipino names such as Angalo and Vigan and Puso for the boys and Vanilla, Matibay, and Langit for the girls. I would like to believe that my great-grandfather, Puso de los Reyes, was in a way special among Don Isabella's 27 children, as his name, Puso, is actually Don Isabella's own alter ego, and as far as his novel, Ang Sing Sing, Nang Dalagang Marmol is concerned. Don Isabella de los Reyes was a polymath, good in thinking, in writing, and he was also an educator, a businessman, and a politician. He has a monument somewhere in UP Diliman, honoring him as the father of Philippine labor, labor movements. He learned Marxism from the bowels of the Montuic Castle in Spain, during his time in incarceration uh, due to his involvement in the anti-Spanish revolution. He has another monument somewhere in Taft Avenue, honoring him as the co-founder of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente. He has impressive works in Filipino theology and philosophy, although many of these are still in the Spanish language. Dr. Jose Rizal looked down on my great-grandfather because Don Isabello did not have a European education and because he advocated for regional and local studies that threatened Dr. Rizal's nationalist discourse. Uh, now, for many of us who never studied abroad and who are now pursuing regional and local studies hand in hand with nationalist studies, we can draw so much inspiration from Don Isabello de los Reyes. It was my father, Dr. Peorilio de Materio III, who thought about setting up this prize to honor my great-great-grandfather and to encourage the younger Filipino scholars of philosophy not only to contribute towards the development of Filipino philosophy, but more so to use philosophy to enrich Philippine culture and intellectual lives, just like what Don Isabello did during his own lifetime. My father wanted to build Don Isabello's third national monument, this time an intangible one, on an intangible space somewhere in the hearts of those who believe in Filipino philosophy. I wish to thank the Philosophical Association of the Philippines through the le leadership of Dr. Jeremiah Hoven Joaquin for graciously agreeing to launch and manage the Don Isabella de los Reyes Prize for Filipino philosophy for the past four years or so. I join my father, Dr. Ferdinand Demetrio III, in renewing our support for the Don Isabella de los Reyes Prize for Filipino philosophy for another three years. I hope that the Philosophical Association of the Philippines will accept our humble pledge. The winners of the Don Isabella de los Reyes Prize 2020 are 
Dr. Peter Paul Elicor of the Ateneo de Davao University and Mr. Victor Loquias of the Ateneo de Naga University. Congratulations to Dr. Elicor and Mr. Loquias. Thank you. And so for our first speaker, we have win of the winner, Dr. Peter Paul Elicor from the Ateneo de Davao University to deliver Dialogues with Children. What can Filipino philosophy gain from philosophizing with children? Dr. Peter, good morning. Good morning, Manfler. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference and most especially to the estate of Don Isabella de los Reyes for the very generous grant. I hope you are doing well. Uh, so this is the title of my presentation, Dialogues with Children, What Do Filipino Philosophers Gain from Philosophy for or with Children? Um, so these are the questions that guide my presentation today. What is uh, philosophy for children? What can philosophy for children contribute to Filipino philosophy? And what are the benefits of E4C? philosophy for children. I hope that after this talk, I can enlighten some of you who are wondering what philosophy for children is and its possible contributions to Filipino philosophy. Now, let me address the first question. What is philosophy for children? Philosophy for children is a program designed by Matthew Lipman and his colleagues in the 70s, which maintains that uh, philosophy is not only a theoretical exercise of abstract knowledge, but also a dialogical practice anyone can engage with regardless of age or academic background. It asserts that even children can be an apprentice of wisdom, therefore de-emphasizing the notion that philosophy is reserved only for the philosophically trained adults. The Community of Inquiry, or COI, provides the context of a structured dialogue where children think together raise and address questions that matter to them, probe assumptions, and build on each other's ideas. Unlike a philosophical debate that privileges the better argument, the COI follows a democratic process whereby all points of view are treated as scaffolds to arrive at a broader understanding of a problem. So the philosopher who facilitates these dialogues is called a public philosopher. From these general descriptions, we can draw out P4C's key features, namely children, community, dialogue, and the role of a public philosopher. With this in mind, I now proceed to the second question. What can philosophy for children contribute to Filipino philosophy? At least two assumptions are underlying this question. One, that there is a Filipino philosophy, and two, it has enough room where new philosophical initiatives can be admitted. Acknowledging that there is not one Filipino philosopher who can provide a definitive understanding of Filipino philosophy, I review some of the salient thoughts of three Filipino philosophers, namely Quito, uh, Gripaldo, and Abulad, particularly on what they said about Filipino philosophy. The purpose is not to comprehensively review their contributions but to find spaces where P4C as a philosophical praxis could position itself within Filipino philosophy. I now begin with Quito. Quito observed that despite the abundance of folk philosophy, quote, questions on the meaning and nature of things in the sense of a Veltang Zhao or in the Socratic manner are not discuss discussed on the grassroots level, quote, end quote. For her, the grassroots level constitutes the Filipino Volksgeist, which should emerge as a formalized philosophy on the academic level. During her time, however, the grassroots philosophy is still in the process of formalization. Kito may have heard, perhaps distantly, about P4C. The late 1960s, which was also when she published her early works, saw the beginnings of P4C in the U.S., and it gradually gained popularity outside the States in the 70s through the 90s. p 
P4C came to our shores only in the early 90s after Zosimo Lee and his colleagues trained after or under Lippmann. And I could imagine that engaging with children as a philosophical praxis was hardly conceivable during Kito's time. I also wonder if she thought of children as part of the category of the grassroots. I assume she did not for the obvious reason that children's perspectives were often considered trivial, not philosophical. So to some, ex to some extent, this deficit view towards children is still prevalent today. When one speaks of the Volksgeist, this refers not actually to everyone, but to the collective mind only of the adults, particularly the old, seasoned, and mature, or to use a popular phrase, those pabalik na. They are those who, by virtue of age and experience, are entitled to bequeath some nuggets of wisdom to the young. On the other hand, children and young people are expected to only receive advice from the old because they are papunta pa lang. Since wisdom is often associated with age, so by simple inference, the younger the person is, the less wise he or she is. However, recent studies of childhood assert that children are epistemic agents thereby capable of constructing a sense of who they are, and they're also capable of making sense of their own reality. They acquire, build, and share knowledge dialogically and interdependently with their social and cultural environment. Thus, children can be important sources or givers of knowledge and also wisdom. Their unique experiences and how they perceive them from their standpoint offer an invaluable perspective about the world we share. When we consider children as natural philosophers capable of contributing to the Filipino Volksgeist, and by including them in our praxis, we are in effect redrawing the boundaries that limit who can and who cannot philosophize. And at the same time, reconfiguring how philosophizing can be practiced. So by expanding our notion of the grassroots, we find in Quito space where we can possibly place children as epistemic agents. I now turn to Gripaldo. Gripaldo ob observes that in the Philippines, what we need, quote, are philosophical innovations are distinctively the products of profound philosophical minds, something that will separate one's thoughts from the thoughts of others before him or her. End quote. For him, mastering a philosopher or a field of specialization while maintaining an independent mind is a quality that a Filipino philosophy should embody. He left us with three ways to become a genuine philosopher, namely to innovate by transforming a previous philosophical position to a much improved position, to reject an old philosophical thought, and create a new path to philosophizing or to review old philosophical questions and offer new insights. Looking closely, one can notice that these ways are predicated on the assumption of individual excellence. For an aspiring philosopher, the journey towards authenticity is characterized by a steep intellectual rigor that only the individual can carry out and realize. Each of these ways requires withdrawal from the world and into the mind to think, to read, to research, and write. The process demands a lot of introspection, relentless questioning, meticulous attention, and silent dialogues within oneself. If this assumption is correct, it means that Gripaldo's ways makes sense only when the pursuit of authenticity is taken as an individ individual-centered activity which, by the way, is not the same as individualistic. On the other hand, in engaging philosophically with children, thinking for oneself or individual-centered thinking is complemented by thinking with others. Thus, the assumption deduced from Gripaldo, which reduces thinking as a strictly individual and solitary activity, is not the only assumption about thinking that undergirds the engagement with children. In thinking with others, the preposition with cannot be overstated as this is where the value of dialogue and community enter one's philosophical praxis. 
whereas an adult philosopher does the mental activity of philosophizing single-handedly, for little philosophers, the various forms of thinking necessary for philosophical inquiry are shared or and carried out by the community. This is important because it is where the collaborative dimension of dialogues will, will become very significant. So through the COI, children think together like one big head building on each other's ideas. And the insights acquired could never have been reached by the individuals alone. In other words, philosophical thinking among children is done not individually, but through the synergy of the individual members in the community. Thus, thinking with others makes it possible for children to sustain a philosophical inquiry. So by expanding our, or the notion of the individual-centered assumption underlying our idea of philosophical thinking, we find in Gripaldo space where we can possibly place dialogue and community. I now turn to Abulad. For Abulad, the central question of Filipino philosophy is not its method or contents, but rather the level of commitment Filipino philosophers put in their work. Drawing inspiration from Quito, he advocates for a philosophical attitude characterized by openness and sensitivity towards one's being in the world. For him, quote, the new language of philosophy admits of anything, whether it's anthropological, descriptive, or exploratory, so long as it is grounded in the world and its situation, end quote. He even cautions to, get, to not get stuck with one or any methodology, but simply, quote, to philosophize as one is inspired to do without the thought that how one does it is the only way of doing philosophy, end quote. He seems to be implying that we should leave to the future generation of Filipino philosophers the task of determining whether our present work means anything to Filipino philosophy, if at all. Abulad's point is simple yet compelling. On the one hand, it re-emphasizes the constant challenge to make philosophy relevant. But at the same time, it maintains the level of discipline and rigor in dealing with the great works. The philosopher is as important as the quality of his or her thinking. So rather than directing the question towards Filipino philosophy, like asking, is there a Filipino philosophy? What is it, etc.? Abulad points the question instead to the Filipino who wishes to do philosophy, as if asking, do you have what it takes? This brings us to the role of the philosopher in P4C. Can a Filipino philosopher who dabbles in P4C live up to the demands set by Abulad? Engaging with children through philosophical dialogues is a form of public philosophy. The public philosopher in this case feels the obligation to communicate with non-specialists, particularly children, who despite their lack of knowledge in academic philosophy, um, you know, have, they have the predisposition to explore philosophical questions and problems that have riddled great minds. This kind of philosophical praxis is like returning to the marketplace where one finds ordinary people, including children, who are sincerely concerned about questions and issues that matter to them, and most of which are philosophical. P4C, however, does not make the philosophical discipline any less rigorous. Just as one is expected to maintain due diligence and patience in mastering a field of specialization, Philosophers who engage with children are likewise expected to sustain an unwavering commitment in following its progress and keeping up with new questions and directions. For instance, in recent years, philosophers doing P4C are making progress in expanding the domains of philosophy of childhood and other subdisciplines in epistemology and ethics. This debunks the notion that P4C is a pseudo-philosophy or a mere extension in the discourses on childhood education that does not merit the title philosophy. And this also addresses the worry that by going down to the level of kids, a philosopher might lose his or her professional value. So by expanding our notion of exploratory philosophy, we find in Abulad a space where we can place the role of a public philosopher.
finally, I now proceed to the last question. What are the benefits of doing T4C? I think there are three levels uh, in answering this question. First level is for children. Definitely, it will benefit children. And I think there are two reasons. First is that P4C gives children a head start in discovering the wonders of philosophical thinking, not only for oneself, but with others. Along with this are a host of other benefits, such as developing empathy, confidence, enhancing communication skills, literacy, and so on. Another benefit is that treating children as a dialogue partner addresses various issues related to our understanding and treatment of children, such as ageism, epistemic injustice, and over-paternalism. The act itself of engaging with children, which presupposes equality and respect, um, responds to these issues. Thus, P4C benefits uh, children by developing their thinking and their sense of autonomy and agency. On the second level, it also benefits philosophers. Dialogues with children can provide a space where philosophical issues are addressed from a child's perspective. Their seemingly naive ideas may point toward conceptual paths that could prompt alternative views to some perennial philosophical questions. So for philosophers, we benefit from their ideas, which actually could challenge some of our own philosophical positions and assumptions. Another benefit, I guess, is that the pro P4C as a program provides various opportunities to do philosophical and empirical research, which is not a common research direction for philosophers. I know of several universities in the South that plan to in integrate P4C in their research projects or community extension projects. Finally, um, third level for the nation, P4C helps raise a generation of Filipinos whose understanding of philosophy is no longer tainted by the pejorative connotation of philosopho. When philosophical dialogues are normalized in the basic education level and the word philosophy or philosophia is associated with the practice of community of inquiry, the prejudice attached to philosopho will slowly fade the, uh, on the horizon over time. It may sound very optimistic, but I think in the future, Filipino philosophy will no longer be an academic exercise for philosophers, but a lived experience for many ordinary Filipinos. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. We move on to Dr. Vic uh, Mr. Victor Loquias from Ateneo de Naga University, who will read the paper entitled The Indeterminacy of Indigeneity and the Emergence of Filipino Philosophies. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Doctor. Let me just share. Take it away. Thank you. Wait. How do we? Okay, I'll. Uh... <laughs> Would this be okay now so I can uh, see the whole <laughs> presentation? Okay, uh, yeah. I would like to thank the estate of Isabel de los Reyes and the Philosophical Association of the Philippines for uh, the research award uh, given to me. Thank you likewise for this platform to present my work in this historical gathering of philosophers and organizations of philosophy in the country. Uh, my paper focuses on the concept of indigeneity as it is found among the multitude of works that fall under or could be associated with the now established research area called Filipino philosophy. The term indigenous or cognate terms such as grassroot, native, or the Filipino term are ubiquitous in the archive. 
Nonetheless, are there no one says in the significations of the term or did the author simply agree and if unequivocally with their employment in reference to or as modification of their philosophizing. So what were the teleological ramifications of this employment and in the various accompanying conceptualizations that granted qualitative requirement for the works to be classified as indigenous? So I undertake to answer these questions and hopefully shed reflexive insights into this idea that has always accompanied various thematizations of Filipino philosophy, but has not, I believe, been fully scrutinized. So the first two parts, the first two parts of uh, my paper performs a reconstructive work of the various utilizations of the indigenous, beginning from the inception of a Filipino philosophy by its luminaries up to the multiplicity of modalities which I shall pertain to as Filipino philosophies uh, in the present. Instead of a single definition, I incorporated different iterations of Filipino philosophy to reconstruct the different standpoints and senses which have animated their respective discourses. An initial notion is already implied at the beginning of this introduction, identifying Filipino philosophy with the materials covered by this research. But analyses of the contents of these works, however, show that there is no single mode in which the idea of Filipino philosophy has been posited, framed, conceived, or contented with. By the idea of Filipino philosophy under quotation, I uh, refer to an assumption from which Filipino philosophy was first posited as an epistemic problem, heralding the beginning of it as a discursive site for what has now become a multiplicity of thematizations. As a common field of ideational elaboration, Filipino philosophy must be described in a less reductive manner to cover and incorporate these various discourses. I relocate into a molar discursive uh, avenue, a description uh, of Bicol given by Federico Lagdameo in his Introduction to the first issue of Bicol Studies. Appropriating his eloquent unifying preface, Filipino philosophy could be also defined as a premise or a promise of an identity in philosophical activity. As premise, it is an assemblage of multiple and diverse perspectives based on historically constituted and precariously fragile societies through its worlds of meaning unfold. As promised, it is a task of identity articulation, an identity in the process of construction and elaboration. Yet I add, considering the various thematis or problematizations of Filipino philosophy found in the literature, it can also be described as a discursive site of contestations and or negotiations. indigenization as Filipinization of philosophy. So philosophizing in the Philippines assumed the modification of indigeneity in the postulation of the idea of Filipino philosophy. Alfredo Ko captures this well in his statement that the idea of Filipino philosophy comes with the idea of a Filipino. Higher education is the avenue of the emergence of this idea in the same way that the origins of nationalism could be traced in a structure, uh, alluding to uh, uh, John Schumacher's uh, paper. Philosophy in the Philippines was coterminous with the beginning of the country as it was brought by the Spanish colonizers and became part of academic instruction in the early institutions of higher learning in the colony. Scholasticism became the sole mode of doing philosophy, which had a long extended presence way after Spanish colonialism was ended in the Philippines. Romualdo Abulad plots this period as the colonial phase of Filipino philosophy. The dominance of scholasticism was only challenged in the 1950s after the exposure to other modes of philosophizing of the post-war Filipino scholars who went abroad for their graduate studies. So this exposure to difference in a way germinated the idea of indigenization insofar as it led to the consciousness of identity in terms of doing philosophy. As Ko rightly explains again, the search for indigenous thought came with the idea to discover a Filipino philosophy. 
In other words, indigenization in this context is tantamount to the Filipinization of philosophy. Abulad supports this in his articulation of the indigenous face with consciousness of the requirements of originative thinking in doing philosophy by Filipinos or by the we of the nation. One of the advocates of the project of indigenous philosophizing was Emerita Quito, who influenced a generation of philosophy of Filipino philosophers in this period. In describing the state of philosophy in the Philippines and charting its future in the national level, Quito vouchsafed the, Filipinis, the Filipinization of philosophy, especially in the employment of the Filipino language, and seemingly suggests in this the synthesis of academic and grassroots philosophy that she has earlier distinguished. In the academic level, philosophy is positioned in the educational structure, which has uh, yet to be Filipinized and make an impact. Yeah, of course, that was on his, in, uh, during her time, 1983. Philosophy in the grassroots level is an affirmation of a latent philosophy in the collective mind of the people waiting for articulation. So a formal Filipino indigenous philosophy then is promised as a futural condition premised on normative resources that could be allowed to surface from collective experience. So one can gain this same insight in Ramon Reyes's description of Filipino thought as a historical event undergoing the stages of development from vital thought to reflexive thought. Like Quito, Reyes alludes to the Filipino as a people, as a we, sharing distinctive traits drawn from the normative descriptions of local so, uh, social scientists. So this appears to be the running mind frame among Filipino scholars who engage directly or work in proximity with the idea of Filipino philosophy. Leonardo Mercado took this as a lifetime project reinforced by the methods of metalinguistic analysis and phenomenology of behavior. Florentino Timbresa combined the path of writing in the Filipino language and drawing from the sources of vital thought. Um, Ferrillo Demeterio reports two modes of indigenization in Timbresa, um, yung exogenous indigenization, which refers to the use of Western and uh, foreign concepts in order to explicate native realities and endogenous indigenization, which meant the use of native concepts in order to explicate Western or foreign realities. Writing in the vernacular became, or even today, is an instrument of the Filipinization of philosophy, whether more uh, vocally or uh, simply performatively. While the esteemed Rocky Ferriols denied allegiance to the project of building philosophy, he did not think of its impossibility no one can create a Filipino or anything else philosophy, he says, except by accident. Yet, in his preface of the same journal issue where Reyes's article was published, Ferriols has given the most profound philosophical articulation of the idea of indigeneity in his terrestrial metaphor of rootedness. So rootedness in the human mind manifests as being, I quote, rooted in the insecurities and creativities of the human brain, not a brain floating in the hot air of discussion groups, but constantly irrigated by a beating heart in a warm body, which body is rooted to. Rootedness in the, for want of a real name, culture, I refer to the heartening in its richness, confusion, potential, frustration, creative milieu in which each Filipino finds himself soaking at birth, which he makes grow, against which he defends himself, within which he leaps, under which he sleeps and dies, which he will cherish in his blood at the resurrection. So Ferriol's employment of his Sampalokis Tagalog could not but be a gesture of this rootedness in which a Filipino is soaked at birth. The idea of Filipino philosophy, however, was also conceived apart from the employment of the Filipino language. This would be the case of some scholars in the Visayas and Mindanao who welcomed the idea, but were not so enthusiastic about the practicality of using the Filipino language in philosophizing within the Cebuana speaking areas of the country. I quote this from Dr. Demeterius and uh, Dr. Uh, Sir Kahan Bing. As Jane Gallimasa candidly remarks in an interview with them, no? Filipino philosophy she says, should mean not only Tagalog philosophy, but could 
to also be Visayan philosophy, although written in the English language. That would still be Filipino philosophy because the realities that are dealt with are Filipino realities like Filipino values, which are distinct from Visayas or uh, Mindanao. So indigenization in the context of the we, of the imagined political community was a shared ground in the localization of the philosophical enterprise. Indigenization in the context of Filipinization emerged as a response to the exposure to difference and experience of indeterminacy, or in the language of the politics of recognition, a vital need in the authorial agency of philosophical activity, which prompted the Filipino philosophy luminaries to engage in a project of self-determination in the philosophical enterprise. At present, the paradigm shifts in the questions posed, such as how to do Filipino philosophy, how to develop Filipino philosophy, and why do we still ask or should still ask the question, what is Filipino philosophy, have produced various modalities of the original idea, which flourished from the ground of the concept of indigeneity. However, while the idea of Filipino philosophy has taken a mainstream value, the concept of the indigenous was not exclusively employed in the molar perspective of nationalism, but to the more molecular level of socially immediate contexts of other authors. This is evident in the usage of the indigenous in reference to the locality, the employment of local languages, and the thematic local material concerns and scope of their studies. The respective regional identity assertions in the act of philosophizing among authors is pulled uh, towards the referential site of Filipino philosophies due technically to their affinity with the molar identity of the nation construed constitutionally uh, in the classification of Ronaldo Gripaldo and uh, or according to any of the qualifications set by Napoleon Mabakiao in being a Filipino philosophy. We can name a few. Okay. Um, for example, uh, Danilo Alterado and Aurelio Agkawili, who endeavors to articulate an indigenous Ilocano philosophy. Okay. Um, Wilmer Joseph Tria, who spearheaded an indigenous philosophizing in the Beacon and even came up with methodological suggestions to develop uh, uh, in, indigenous philosophies further. And uh, Amosa Veles, who philosophizes in both the Cebuano and English languages. So th the more regional context of identity assertion in philosophical activity can be read as well as a form of self-determination out of the experience of indeterminacy in a more local level. The invisibility of these works is due partly to its limited scope and addressed or target audience and uh, the narrow readership that is perhaps drawn by such local and regional scope of studies. Um, out of these reconstructions, indigeneity um, does not seem to have a univocal significance. It is rather an indeterminate concept. There is no broadly accepted understanding of the term indigeneity. But in its indeterminacy, the term allows very different groups to claim indigeneity and to claim it in very different ways. So instead of being a pejorative uh, trait, it has in fact uh, become an avenue for self-determination. Its employment for self-ascription entails a process of determination of societies attached not so much on clearly epistemic projects, but of concrete, more locally immediate material concerns. Indigeneity is a project where self-ascription and self-construction fall together as the foundation on which the group uh, groups advances its project of gaining recognition and rights. So I gleaned the concept of indeterminacy from the critical theorist Axel Honneth, who originally explained suffering from indeterminacy as a rather incomplete understanding of freedom insofar as there is a deficit in the integration of certain aspects of social experience. So uh, the emergence of Filipino philosophies in this sense could likewise be read as an agentive modification of the philosophical enterprise whose continuous discursivity gains or grants esteem or recognition toward towards identity formation. Recently, there seems to be a consensus among Filipino scholars of the need for a more socio-politically grounded approach in doing philosophy in the Philippines. R.T. Pada, for instance, scrutinizes 
the deficit in methodology of some pioneers in Filipino philosophy for a more empirical immersion and engagement with the uniquely situated concrete social issues. In this vein, he calls attention to the weakness of trying to construct a single encompassing identity for a Filipino philosophy in view of the diversified and uniquely situated cultures in the Philippines. Raimundo Pavo proposes a local grounding for Filipino philosophy, which merges the function of social science and philosophy. In a similar tone, Wilmer Tria advocates making philosophy more functional in the prospect of developing indigenous philosoph philosophical concepts. Paulo Bolaños projects that perhaps Filipino philosophy could advance further upon a shift of philosophizing from a purely speculative material st or metaphysical stance to a theoretical materialist practical stance in doing philosophy that is sensitive to social realities from within. Thus, he advocates the appropriation of critical theory uh, for its appropriation, uh, appropriateness as a theoretical tool grounded in social reality. Uh, still in the South, Jeffrey Okai conducted a research on the philosophy of work of a local community in Negros Occidental and his critical appraisal of it as a form of resistance from the destructive tendency of globalization and at the same time as an alternative to social development. In Ferillo Demeteri's indispensable forecast of the developmental potentials of discourses of Filipino philosophy, academic critical analysis stands as the highest among the five ways of doing philosophy with the most developmental potential, of course, corroborated by his empirical survey and assessment. So what the language of indigeneity has fundamentally highlighted is the agentive, recognitive, reappraisal of the modification of philosophizing in the Philippines, which at present is yet to be fully mobilized in terms of its normative thrust and value. Indigeneity, or I mean identity in an indigenous context, is a way of articulating the more immediate site for the self-determination of persons within the society, and conversely, the construction of the society by the persons themselves constituted within it. So uh, indigeneity could be described, therefore, as the relative site of the experience of social uh, recognition. And this relative aspect of recognition redefines the role that philosophy uh, should take and brings home where it should operate more efficiently. So philosophy must assume the function of critique of the society. Um, articulation plus critique of indigenous values uh, uh, basically forms the, uh, the equation of critical indigenous philosophizing. No? Uh, Thomas, uh, Megan Thomas actually uh, makes a uh, um, distinction between Is Isabella de los Reyes' practice of folklore with uh, the practice of folklore in, uh, in the West. No? Um, uh, what is common is that uh, uh, folklore legitimizes an idea of a nation by seeking commonality and history in the practices and beliefs of the folk or the rural, the peasant, the figure supposedly untainted by modern cosmopolitanism with its urban metropolitan cores and provincial tentacles. But she also um, explains no, that uh, De Los Reyes actually uh, used uh, uh, the practice of folklore as a vehicle for criticism of contemporary society and politics. So, so he, he gets to comment on the performance of leaders and so on and so forth. Um, at present, of course, I can, uh, okay, again, uh, just uh, a few examples now from the materials I have uh, garnered. Agkawili performs uh, this kind of uh, critique, for example, in the paper I just cited above, where after articulating the interrelations between the Ilocano concepts of Sanut, Waya Waya, and Naimbag na Bayag, I, I hope I pronounced this well, uh, Ilocano friends. Uh, he goes to identify the Ilocano problem of political dynasties as digressions from these principles. A similar critique on political dynasty and oligarchic politics in Bicol was advanced by a colleague of mine, uh, Adrian Rimodo, from his analysis of the significance of Sadiring Tao in Bicol language. The Sadiring Tao is a familial term no, that uh, breeds oligarchic politics. Uh, in the South, Brother Carl Gaspar scrutinizes the leadership of President Duterte through the lens of the indigenous leadership 
model of respected chieftains among their indigenous communities whose traditional governance system still remains in place. So uh, these are just a few examples. So indigenous philosophizing is as internal critique is a way of localizing the consciousness raising effect of diagnosing social pathologies into the more immediate society of the people. This localizes the therapeutic measures as well that could be initiated and applied towards emancipation and social change. Philosophizing must be able to affect collective praxis in the local level, the possibility of which is easier to imagine when a political culture characterized by engagement and participation is visible in a society, something, however, that is already vanishing from our view. Just mabalos po. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sir Victor. And may we call on, as though we are in a real conference, our two winners po to address some questions. To our audience, it's time to type your questions or to raise your hand. Um, to those who will type their questions, please do so. Doc Pete, morning. Typing at the chat box or at the Q&A. To those who would like Richard to be heard, raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you and give you the floor. So um, I'd like to read something from the chat box, the Q&A box. And the question is from Von, and this is addressed to Dr. Peter. Thanks, Doc Peter, for your talk linking P4C to some of the insights of leading Filipino philosophers. Among the reasons cited by your fellow Filipino P4C proponents, such as Dr. Lee and Dr. Bolaños, which do you think is the most critical in scaling the interest and practice of P4C in our country? Is it producing more research data to convince our policymakers? Is it training more P4C facilitators? Is it finding space in the crowded K-12 curriculum? Thank you. There seems to be many questions here, so <laughs> we'll go, go. Thank you, Sir Vaughn, for those questions. Um, out, okay. I would say yes to all the questions. And between Dr. Lee and Dr. Bolaños, I would say it's Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Bolaños has not uh, dabbled yet in um, philosophy for children, but Dr. Lee is considered as the quote-unquote father of P first in the Philippines because uh, it's him and his colleagues who really um, brought the practice and really um, initiated many activities for not only for children but for teachers in Manila so that P4C would uh, in a way gain traction in our uh, society. Um, and uh, in terms of scaling the interest, so yes, that's Dr. Lee. And by the way, Dr. Lee is still very much supportive to uh, the scholars who are into P4C. Uh, he's very willing to help and to uh, mentor uh, and in fact he is uh, he was my mentor during my uh, uh, dissertation uh, producing research data to convince our policymakers yes and i think there are there were some initiatives there but uh, unfortunately i think this has to be improved um, and training for P4C facilitators, yes, that's also very important. And finding space also in K-12, um, this has been one of the plans in, in the South uh, to, to integrate P4C in the K-12, uh, particularly in the junior or senior high school, but also in the basic education uh, level as well. So uh, I, I hope that answered your question, Sir Vaughn. Thank you very much. Thank you very oh, much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Bolaños Marella. Okay. So I apologize for that. Yes. Um, yeah. So between Dr. Lee and Dr. Marella Bolaños, I guess it's uh, Dr. Lee who um, is most critical in scaling the interest and practice of P4C. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Bolaños. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Bolaños. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Bola
Thank you, Sir Vaughn. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Vaughn. And here's another question from JJ. Excellent talks from both our Isabella winners. Just a quick question. In light of your respective projects, so this is for both, how should we do Filipino philosophy? And where do you think is Filipino philosophy headed in the next few years? So since Doc Peter already answered, the first one to answer now is Victor. Okay. Um, well, I, our pioneers have uh, showed us many paths in doing Filipino philosophy from Dr. Quito and then Dr. Ferrillo Demeter, you have even intensified. So I, I, I personally would not want to, uh, you know, <laughs> limit the way of doing philosophy in just one method. No? Uh, uh, we, we have to be more welcoming and hospitable uh, to uh, different methods uh, in doing philosophy. But I believe also it is important that one, uh, you know, um, one de devotes into a particular one. In my case, uh, because this has been the trajectory of my research, I do critical indigenous philosophizing because this has been, <laughs> historically speaking, my the project that I have uh, uh, underwent in the past. And then when I uh, got to UST, I got exposed to critical theory. So it's basically an, uh, an integration of these two approaches. So I uh, go for critical indigenous philosophizing. So that would be my my, my personal uh, take on doing philosophy and aside from that this is something actually doc peter we, we had no, when we were in ust and um, this is something still no, in my mind no uh, uh brewing uh that it is possible really to come up with you know uh, in the in 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 the past no uh we, we come to articulate uh indigenous concepts but it is actually possible to to draw the connections between different concepts from different regions. Like in my research and my philosophy of education and Bicol, I uh, came up with the idea. Uh, I, 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 I uh, learned, I discovered that truth, uh, the word for truth in Rinconade area, in that, that's one particular uh, uh, called this, uh, city. Uh, or the Rinconada area, it's not really, uh, it's it's a city and a uh, group of towns. The Rinconada area shares linguistic um, uh, similarities with the science. That's why when I said matuod or truth, uh, that is that is actually spoken in Rinconada, Bicol, and also in the Visayan language. And uh, in the neighboring uh, city, in Naga City, tuod has a different meaning, okay? Uh, which basically I used as a concept as a, as a root word for practice, learning, and friendship, which enabled me to come up to draw connections, no? as a, an assemblage of concepts that we could, okay, but of course we need some confidence in articulating that, okay. Uh, kahit anong criticisms pa man yan, dumating, but, uh, you know, uh, we have to create concepts. We have to come up with concepts out of this uh, uh, as, as, uh, assemblage of concepts from different um, linguistic traditions. So uh, truth and friendship is actually something that is linguistically uh, uh, there. <laughs> it's it's normatively situated in language and in our culture. And that is something that we have yet to, to develop. So that, that is what I have seen no, in my experience. I'd just like to insert thank, the point. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank and you. Else? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Alterado also for the papers you have there in uh, uh, in Ilocos. Now, I, I have read these papers, and uh, ang ganda. It's it's uh, it's wonderful to uh, yeah to uh, see these insights. No, um, through you uh, through the papers that you have written. Such a nice insight. I was reminded of um, how metaphors can also qualify to express what we can what we cannot explain exactly. Um, and uh, metaphors are also based on a particular local. And since you have already talked about translations, uh, PAP would have um, a future project involving translation. So I would I would know who to approach. So check tayo dyan, sir. Okay. okay sir Peter, you, how Laura. about you? What's your take on that? Um, thank you, Ma'am uh, For the first question, I think uh, I would also agree with uh, Sir Victor uh, and also Doc Abulad uh, that uh, the language of philosophy, Filipino philosophy, admits to any type of uh, exercise or initiative. And I think it would be uh, detrimental to Filipino philosophy to limit itself to just one 
um, uh, method or theme or direction. Uh, in terms of uh, where Filipino philosophy is headed in the next few years, I would say internal internationalization, which is uh, I think one of the also, one of the drives of USAP and uh, and PAP. Um, in in P4C, for instance, um, there is an organization called PCYNAP, uh, um, a group of P4C scholars and practitioners in the Asia Pacific. And the president at the moment is a Filipino philosopher, C. Rainer Ibana of Ateneo de Manila. And so P4C, uh, we're bringing Filipino children and Filipino scholars in the international level. And I think uh, we are making some impressions on the international community. So I guess that's where we are headed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have other questions? We still have more time, so please don't hesitate. Wala na? Okay. Pues, ako ang magtatanong. <laughs> I'll ask Dr. Peter. And maybe I'm not just asking as a philosophy, may a uh, philosophy scholar, but more, more importantly, as a parent to grade schoolers. Um, I have seen the trend that... Um, grade schoolers are still being trained to have competencies that are stuck in the basic R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And the tendency would be to learn on mechanisms or to learn about science and math specifically. So they kind of end up um, being routinary and um, I think creativity is stunted. Uh, as far as I know, based on my observation, uh, P4C has not yet penetrated the system. Uh, I'd like to know your take on that. Uh, when is it that we will be able to penetrate basic education and make philosophy for children really occur in schools and not just in small circles? And I'm talking about the big schools actually doing it. So I hope, I hope you can help me out with that. Yeah, in terms of the question when, nah, I really don't know. At the moment, I think P4C is at its infancy stage. Uh, even infancy? if, yeah, if P4C was already introduced to the Philippines in the 90s, it has not really gained traction in terms of practice. Yes, there were trainings, there were uh, circles, there were uh, initiatives, um, and but, but these were these initiatives are not institutionalized, meaning after, say, one summer, like, for instance, in PCYNAP, uh, our children's circle initiative or this P4C activity started last April and ended in May, and then it will start again in August and then maybe end in November. So, uh, but it's, it's not, it, the, in terms of sustainability, uh, P4C has to, uh, do more in in terms of convincing teachers and principals and policymakers to make it part of the curriculum, um, and I think this is also connected to the question uh, earlier about uh, placing P four C in this crowded K to twelve curriculum, um, and I think there there should be a long way to go. <laughs> I agree with you, Mumfler. Uh, I think my kiddo is still one year old at the moment. We'll also experience your the experience of your kids who would find uh, basic education to you know, a routinary, mechanical, and so on. But I think at the moment, what we can do as Filipino philosophers is, and parents at the same time is to you know, conduct dialogues with our children and maybe do some uh, personal voluntary initiatives in the community. That's what I do uh, like with with my neighbors as well. And so that uh, is one of the reasons that makes P4C quite difficult because unlike uh, our usual jobs in universities and colleges where we just go to the classrooms and teach, we have to find ways. We're not compensated. It's purely voluntary at the moment. And so it's really, you know, that's why I really, I really don't agree with people who would say that P4C is just you know, a very simple thing to do because it requires a lot of commitment, time, effort, and energy. 
uh, imagine your your Saturday, Saturdays, for instance, or you know, uh, your family time with, uh, is is no longer available because of you know some initiatives on the side. So yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, maybe if we, if of course, I'm not saying that all Filipino philosophers should dabble in P4C, but there are, I guess, Filipino philosophers and scholars who might see this as an opportunity to exercise philosophical thinking and practice. So, you know, if we come together, just like what the uh, Mercado said in his one of his late papers, we have to find a common theme where we can work as as a community. I guess, you know, and I think there are already initiatives on that on that area. Like uh, in UP, there are students who form these uh, initiatives to reach out to the young, not only to children, but to youth as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's another in the chat, but I've been told that um, we have to move on um, because of the economy of time and uh, we're catching up because of internet and all. So maybe if you have other questions, then you may directly chat the speakers. But for now, maybe we call on... Um, the president of PAP, Dr. JJ Joaquin, uh, to read uh, what's in the certificate of recognition. JJ. Thank you, Fleur. Thank you to our Isabello winners, 2020 winners. Uh, your research truly inspires people. I hope they will inspire people to do work in Filipino philosophy. And as you have said, there are many, many roads to Filipino philosophy and we should just venture one, any of them. So this certificate of recognition is presented to Peter Paul Eligor and of course, Victor John Diaz for delivering a research paper entitled uh, your respective papers as winners of the then Isabella de las Reyes Award in the conference entitled Emerging Philosophies of Religion in Southeast Asia held on July 21 to 24. So this conference serves as the second USAP summit, uh, the PAP's national conference, and the PAP PARS joint meeting. Sign yours truly, Dexel Tirado, Saraj, and Fernie. Congratulations to both of you. And for you guys, we are launching the next round of Don Isabella de las Reyes Awards. So we'll keep you posted. I'll turn you over to Fleur.